Going Green Conference. Uh, this is a series we've been doing since 2018, thanks to a USDA Natural Resource Conservation Services grant. Um, I'm Michelle Burns. I'm the Executive Director of Tecumseh Land Trust. And uh, with me today we have uh, Lauren Jessing. You've seen her running around. She's outside at the registration table. Um, Sarah is an intern with us from Wittenberg, and then we have a couple board members here. Kate's in the back, and I think Kathy's still out front. So if you have any questions or comments, uh, please feel free to grab any one of us. We'll be here all, all morning. Um, so uh, I think most of you know, but just to say a few housekeeping things, the bathrooms are directly across from this room. Snacks, coffee, hot tea are on the table. Um, the first presentation will be about an hour. We'll take a 10 minute break and then we'll have the second presentation so that we wrap up here. Um, so with that, uh, let me just say a little bit about Tecumseh Land Trust in case you don't know about our organization. We uh, protect and preserve prime farmland and natural areas in Clark, Green and surrounding counties. We have 35,000 acres under conservation easements, which we are very, very proud of, well on our way to our goal of 50,000 in each county. Um, in addition to land preservation, though, we do offer these educational events um, in the hopes of connecting landowners and farmers with resources and people that can um, help them implement uh, good conservation practices because that, in essence, is a way to preserve land as well. So. Um, although we're wrapping up this Growing Green series, uh, we do have several other conservation events uh, this year. There's a flyer out on the, our table in the lobby that outlines those events, and then we'll continue to plan more events like this in the future. So we hope to get you out on some good properties and see some, some interesting projects. So uh, with that said, we are a nonprofit organization and we rely on memberships to keep our doors open every so I invite you to connect with us um, by becoming a member so that you'll get notified of all of our events in the future. So, but with that, let's jump right into cover crop opportunities. I, um, it is my great pleasure to uh, introduce Jim Horman with Horman Soil Health Services. Jim has a Bachelor's of Science in Agriculture, a Master's in Business, a Master's in Ag Agricultural Economics, and is a PhD candidate in Environmental si Sciences from the Ohio State University. He's worked um, as an extension educator, an assistant professor for OSU. Uh, it's, his entire work has been specializing in soil health, cover crops, nutrient recycling, and water quality. Um, more recently, Jim was with NRCS, uh, working as the regional soil health specialist for a five-state area. He has his own business now, the performance of soil health services, and um, he's worked for over two decades in cover crops and no-till. So um, Jim's got uh, uh, just tons of experience and uh, I'd to come up here and share that with you. Thanks. All right, well, thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, starting to make me feel a little old here, I think. <laughs> uh, all those things, I wonder if this will come out. Oh, it does and there's directions right there on how to do that. Okay, so, well, I'll let you push. do that. Okay. I'm one of those guys, I just can't stand behind a podium. That just drives me nuts. So, been very busy here. Uh, uh, been doing a lot of traveling. Uh, been to uh, Kansas and uh, Pennsylvania, Maryland. Uh, Monday I go to Battle of Axe, uh, Michigan. And then uh, later this next week uh, we'll be out in Champaign, Illinois. So. A lot of interest now coming back on this soil health after we've had uh, some COVID. It just seems like there's been a, a flurry of interest now in, uh, in soil health that was maybe a little bit suppressed. So we're going to talk a little bit about the cover crops, and we might even hit on a couple other little topics uh, here. Do we have a clicker? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. That would be wonderful. Here we go. So uh, mainly we're going to talk about how cover crops uh, what to plant, uh, how to plant them, and uh, how to terminate them, and uh, all that, how it works really well with no-till. I like to tell people that no-till is maybe one-third of the solution, but if you want to uh, really start to solve some of our environmental issues with uh, nutrient and uh, water 
pollution and climate and all those things, you really got to have the cover crops. The cover crops are the other two thirds of that solution. With every single cover crop, we've got a live root. And with those live roots, you're going to have a thousand to two thousand times more microbes associated with those. Each one of those microbes is just a soluble bag of fertilizer. So when farmers plant the cover crops, what they're finding is the microbes are feeding the plants and the plants are feeding them. And you've got to have the sugars and all these uh, root exudates out there and so that you have good soil structure. With good soil structure, you allow the air and the water to get into the soil and you also then improve your productivity. And you'll find out that your nutrient efficiency so that you don't have this uh, all these nutrients running off come from having live roots. I always ask this question, what do live roots do? They absorb soluble nutrients, soluble nitrogen, soluble phosphorus, and the big topic that I've been speaking on to just about every group, but we won't have time today, is on the micronutrients and how we can use micronutrients to improve not only the food that we eat, increase the nutrient density, but it also increases our yields. Every one of those micronutrients uh, activates certain enzymes and that increases your biological activity. Well, if you increase your biological activity, what else do you do? You also start to store more carbon and more of these micronutrients in the soil. So cover crops are really the foundation, the cover crops and the no-till in order to make this work. I'll, I'll say one other thing and uh, we'll talk just a little bit. One of the biggest things, and one of the reasons I kind of got a little fed up with working for the government, I lasted three years. I'll tell you what, I could not. I knew within three weeks that after starting with the government that I made a big mistake, but uh, I basically had to stick with it just so I could get my uh, money that we put in for the pension. So I lasted three years, but they have gotten away from soil erosion. Can anybody tell me what the average soil erosion rate is in the United States? Any idea? It's 7.2 tons per acre per year. Okay? Now, you probably can't visualize that, so let me see if I can break it down for you. Uh, 7 point, I'm sorry, 7.6. I, under, I understated it. 7.6. So that's roughly 15,000 pounds. 2,000 times 7.6. 15,200 pounds, and let's compare that to a farmer that raises soybeans. And if I raise 50 bushel soybeans, a bushel of soybeans is 60 pounds, that's 3,000 pounds. Now this number is going to shock you. For every one pound of soybeans that we produce, we lose, on average in this country, five pounds of topsoil. Does that shock you? It should. Okay, and I hate to tell you, but that number is underestimated because that only uh, counts for wind and then sheet and rill erosion. It does not account for gully erosion, okay? And the, the government has a strange way. Sometimes they, they try to show that they're making improvements, but maybe the improvements aren't there. They sometimes change the definitions of things just so it makes it look like they're doing a better job. But if you go back, Sometimes they've recently come out with some other numbers. Then I went back and looked at their definitions and he changed some of the definitions around. So you can't always trust the government to do everything quite right for you. And I just lost my hand there. I must have stepped on it. Oh, man. Let's see if we can get this thing to go. If not, I will just yell. How's that? There we go. Sorry. So I'm one of those guys that just can't stand to be in one spot, but let's see if I can do it. Let's talk a little bit about these different cover crops. And this is, I, I don't expect you to be able to read it, okay? Sorry for that. It'd be nice if I could blow it up, but we call this the periodic table of cover crops. So what we have here is all the different cover crops, and, I, and there's, there's more. They keep adding some every year, but just to give you an idea. So on either end, what we have are different grasses. So on the left hand side we have barley, oats, rye grass, wheat, cereal rye, triticale, and annual uh, fescue. Okay, so these are a couple grasses that we use as cover crops. Most of these are what we would call uh, winter annuals, so they'll survive the winter. Now, 
Oats will die out with, you know, if it gets down to about 17, it's going to die out. On the other side, we have what we call the summer annuals. So those are the things that only grow in the summer, and as soon as it freezes, they're going to they're going to die out. So things like pearl millet, very very pretty uh, 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 plant. Uh, uh, you got some some different millets in there. You got sorghum, sedan grass, teff, uh, and and even corn. Maize would be there. In the middle, what we have are the broad leaves. And right in the center, we have all our different legumes. This purple column there are what we call the brassicas. So the brassicas are your turnips, your radish, your beets, your carrots, kind of your kale and your rape. And we don't even have kale and rape. Oh, yeah, kale and rape's right next to it. I'm sorry. So yeah, in the yellow there. So uh, those are all different types of cover crops that we can grow. All right, so the legumes are going to give us nitrogen. The grasses are going to mainly give us uh, some carbon. And then the, uh, the, the brassicas are very good at controlling a lot of our weeds. They're also good at breaking up the compaction and doing things like that. So that's some broad categories. The way you can use this chart, this was developed in North Dakota, is they've got all these different symbols on there. So some of them take a little more water. Some take a little less. Some of them are annuals. Some of them are biannuals. Some are perennials. And then there, there's some of them that are very low growing, and then there's some that are more upright. And what we really like to do is, if at all possible, we're going to put out a cover crop mixture, we like to have just like one in each one of these different categories. So right after wheat, we have a very, fairly long growing season yet. If we take that wheat off, say, in uh, July, uh, first part of July, we've got several months there, and we can put out maybe a six-way, seven-way, eight-way, even a ten-way mixture. And by doing that, you'll get different types of root architect out there. Different. Some of them will be very shallow, some will be very deep, some will be fibrous, some will be uh, more of a tap root. And then they don't generally compete with each other, and we end up with more biomass. And when the more biomass you get above ground, what happens to the biomass below ground? It's about equal. So whatever you see above ground, generally you have about that equal amount below ground, and that's going to be our carbon that we're going to start to add, and that's how we're going to start to build up our organic matter in the soil. Okay? So that's what we're doing with this cover crop chart. Okay? This is a whoop, 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 come back here. This is kind of the goal is to have one of these different all these different categories. So cool season grass, mix that with a warm season grass, a cool season uh, broadly and mix that with the warm season broadly. Now, if it gets too late in the growing season, we're gonna just use just the cool season because we don't have enough time to grow it. But say after a week, we can use all four. Once we go after corn and soybeans, we're probably limited to just using the cool season ones, okay? And these are the different types that we're gonna look at now. We'll look at the legumes. Mainly uh, make nitrogen. They have a little bit lower carbon to nitrogen ratio. Generally tend to have tap roots, but things like this would include your, your cow peas, your winter peas, uh, your hairy batch, red and sweet clover, sun hemp, lupins, soybeans. I could probably add uh, the crimson clover and the uh, Valencia. We'll be talking about those. When we get into the grasses, they are going to accumulate more, have a lot more finer roots. So they really help uh, break up your soil and uh, allow that soil to have better structure, have usually a little bit higher C to N ratio, that carbon to nitrogen ratio. Uh, just depends on when they're terminated, uh, but we're, we're looking at oats, wheat, cereal rye, annual rye, grass, barley, sorghum, sedan, and millets. And then the brassicas, they're really good for that surface compaction and weed control. Most of the time we're going to be using these acorn radish. They're the white radish, turnips, kale, and grapes. Those are kind of the big ones. And then we have a couple other ones that don't fit these categories, things like buckwheat and sunflower. Okay, so we'll talk try about all of them. Let's start with the radishes. One of the things we know about the radishes is uh, they grow very quickly and put on a big green, but they're very high in moisture. They're going to freeze out and die at about 15 degrees. Now, has anybody here ever been around a radish when it, I like to say, it kind of turns to elephant snot? You ever see it when, when they freeze? They just really get gooey. Boy, do they stink. 
And, and, and the reason they stink is because they're high in sulfur. And usually about January, right after Christmas, we'll get some warm days where it'll get up into the 50 degrees, and for about four or five days, those radish just stink to high heaven. Okay, so you got to be careful where you put them. The reason farmers like them is they got a, a, a deep tap root. They really break up the soil and they allow the water to, to go down. Now, one of the things you got to be careful with on radishes, a couple years ago, I was working in uh, Putnam County. I was the extension educator there. And I got a phone call and uh, uh, they said, hey, uh, Bowling Green just registered one of the highest phosphorus runoffs that they've ever had. It was in January. It was at one of these freeze-thaw cycles and it had gotten warm. They said, Jim, can you explain what's going on? Well, I went out and looked at that watershed. It was up in, near Tippin, and the whole township had put out radish at 8 to 10 pounds per acre. You never need more than 2 pounds, okay? We have a new rule for that. Well, those radishes got real big turned to basically elephant snot when the snow had melted and the rains came down, that hole was real close to where the tile was, washed all the nutrients right down into the tile, had one of the largest uh, runoffs of soluble reactive phosphorus we've ever seen. Does that mean that the radish are bad? No, just got to understand, mother, likes the, mother nature likes diversity. So add in some grasses and reduce the rate on your, your radishes, get it down to no more than two. I was kind of responsible, working as a soil health specialist, talked to NRCS to limiting it to two pounds per acre. When those radishes die, the grasses will take over. They'll get right into where those radishes are, suck up those nutrients, keep those nutrients recycling, and then you won't get the phosphorus in those big holes, okay? so. You just got to understand Mother Nature doesn't like monocultures, one single plant. She likes to have a diversity, okay? They do release this natural fumigant. That really helps with natural weed control. Uh, there's a, um, a, um, a compound in there that just doesn't allow most weed seeds to germinate. They're very good at absorbing nitrogen. However, when they die, they're going to release that nitrogen. So that's when you want to have another grass out there or something else that will, will soak it up, okay? They do smell bad. I like to say they smell like a really bad, dirty diaper. We've had uh, uh, some uh, uh, fire departments actually call up and ask if we can put out. I said, well, here's the thing. They said, people will come home. A lot of times they come home late at night, maybe after they've been partying and they think they have a gas leak, okay? It's actually just the radishes. I said, well, what if they do have a gas leak? I said, I'm not going to put anything out, but we just need to make people aware that some of these things do have kind of a bad smell to them. And a lot of people were, were calling the fire department all the time saying they thought they had a gas leak when it was just radishes, okay? So this is what they look like. Oh, come on. Come back. This thing is really, really sensitive. There it is. This is what they look like. So that's a really big radish. Now, as big as that radish is, um, actually, that's only about 50% of it. The low ground, it has all these tiny little root hairs that are going out, and they're really good at compaction, okay? They will take out, uh, as they go down, they push out and they physically lift the soil up, and they're adding a lot of carbon back into that soil, okay? So that's kind of what they look like uh, in, in, the, in the fall. What are some of the advantages? Again, deep, penetrating root. Reduce the compaction. The earthworms just love them. Uh, they, they really do bring up a lot of uh, nutrients, but those nutrients will become available once they die, so you've got to have something else to keep them recycling. You can even graze them, okay? Disadvantages, you don't want to sow them too early. Uh, they can go to seed, and sometimes some of them will... Um, um, actually have hard seed and may survive and come up in the spring. They're pretty easy to kill. If you sow them too late, you won't get a whole lot of good out of them. They need at least six to seven. <laughs> so here's what they do for compaction. They reduce your compaction by greater than 40%. Okay, So that's why a lot of farmers like to use them. Uh, this was taken on Dave Brandt's farm. Some of you may know Dave Brandt. Uh, 
apparently Dave Brandt has a reputation. He's one of the best. Have you guys all know what a, a meme is? He's the most popular meme on uh, Puerto Rico, Ohio. He lives southeast of uh, Columbus. He's a farmer. He's about six foot four. Wears bib overhauls, and apparently uh, people like to use him on uh, Twitter, whatever social media. Like he's, he's one of the best known memes out there, I guess. So, what were these things good for? Well, they actually t do take up a lot of nitrogen. Where we had the oil seed radish and we measured how much nitrogen was in the soil, it was 6.5 parts per million, compared to where we had no cover, it was 21.3. Now that's only good for as long as that nitrogen's in the radish, as soon as they die, they're gonna release it. So this is showing that, yeah, these can be beneficial. If you're gonna do the radishes, we would recommend that you do these in the uh, summer, late fall. Really, really <coughs> I just yell. And sure. Yell. Right. Yeah. This is becoming extremely annoying for me, <coughs> causing me problems. Every time I wiggle it, it uh, <laughs> let's just uh, turn it off. We got a small group. I think you can all hear me, can't you? I'll just make a conscience effort to uh, talk as loud as possible. All right? And that also frees me up so I can run. All right. This is what they look like. These are the radish carcasses. And this is with uh, winter peas. We call them carcasses because when you go out there and you actually pick these up, they're like a dried sponge. They, they'll, they'll break right apart. We used to have guys that were a little bit uh, uh, concerned about trying to plant because when you've got a radish that's that big, they would probably plant into that and they would think that the seed would disappear. But actually the ground is so mellow, you can plant right over the top, right beside it, or right in between it. It doesn't seem to hurt it. Okay, so, so that's what these radishes look like and the winter peas uh, come next spring, okay? Rape seed, that's another one. Uh, kale seed, both of these are um, winter annuals, so they will survive. You're going to have to terminate them uh, in the spring. There's a couple different ways we can terminate them. Some farmers will use herbicides, uh, but other farmers are now using what we call crimper rollers. And you can go out there and without having to use herbicides, it's kind of like an organic method, a mechanical way. It just runs across the, uh, the soil and it has blades on it and it will kink the stems and, uh, and they'll die. So kale and rape are uh, both pretty cold tolerant. The kale seed can reach 25 inches tall. Uh, the wildlife really seems to like it. Uh, the rape seed uh, can be as much as 15 to 25 percent crude protein. So we use it for forage. It's got to be planted maybe just a week earlier than the kale. So generally, cereal rye would be the one that we can plant just about any month of the year. Then we're probably going to go with kale, say the end of October. And then maybe about mid-October, you can still plant uh, your rapeseed. Most of our other cover crops, unfortunately, have to be planted uh, probably before the end of September. So usually we're planting a lot of our cover crops after wheat, uh, anywhere from after wheat, which would be July, to maybe the 1st of August, all the way into September. And that's one of the problems that we're having with cover crops right now is a lot of our farmers are using, uh, uh, planting soybeans and corn, and they may not take off that corn or soybeans till uh, October or November. So now, all of a sudden, there's this big interest in new technology. I had a farmer this last year that is using a drone, and he planted cover crops, 625 acres of soybeans using a drone. And the drone will go up, he'll put in, he put in something like uh, Valencia, and he put that on at five pounds to the acre. And with the drones, we can go back and forth and get those uh, fields seeded and then the plants start to grow. We come in and we harvest it, and that puts a little bit of cover across that cover crop, and it might even actually help with uh, protecting it through the winter. And then by the time we're harvesting, sometimes we got cover crops up that are that big. The other thing we're starting to do is we're actually starting to interseed cover crops in June. Certain cover crops we can actually plant in between the rows in June, and they'll kind of stay dormant, uh, they don't take a lot of moisture most years, just enough to get them started. 
And then once the cooler weathers and the rain come in the fall, then they generally start to grow. And uh, so a couple different ways that we're planting and harvesting these cover crop. This is what the gale looks like. That's what the dwarf X6 rape look like. Very similar, actually. Uh, that's the kale. They're, they're a little hard to tell, uh, but this is the same kale that you can make uh, kale chips out of. Okay, I actually did that one year, took some in. Depends on your taste. Uh, I wasn't a big fan of them, but yeah, I tried it, and uh, yeah, they, you can't eat them. Okay. Uh, not my cup of tea, but might be, might be yours. Okay. Grasses, what do they do? Provide carbon. The big thing that the grasses help us with when we're in a corn soybean rotation, we know that the soybeans provide nitrogen to your corn, all right? What we didn't know was what benefit was that corn to that soybean. And we're finding out that with those fibrous roots, the corn is helping us with phosphorus uptake. So, so that's why we like to have this diversity out there. We like to have a few legumes and clovers to give us nitrogen. Then we want to have some grasses in there to help recycle the phosphorus. And then we'll have some of the other uh, cover crops in there that also help with, with uh, the micronutrients, okay? Uh, grasses, very good at helping with the, with the horizontal. So usually we get the vertical com uh, compaction, but with these fibrous roots going out, they also loosen the soil up so that when the water comes in, it not only goes straight down, but it also starts to spread out in the water. And what we typically see is where you have a no soil <laughs> cover crop field, when it rains, the water won't pond. I don't know if you guys have noticed here, but in the last couple weeks, we've gotten one inch, one and a quarter, maybe one and a half inch rains. Have you looked around? There's ponds everywhere. These fields are just absolutely flooded. Now, it goes away, but what happens? When that water runs off, it runs off the surface and it takes all the nutrients on the surface and it gets it in the ditch. Or if, the, if there's, it's been conventionally tilled, the water may go over until it comes to a crack and it'll go straight down and go out of tile lines. When you see a no-till in a cover crop field, what's the difference? The water goes in and it spreads out and it'll soak in very quickly, but it'll take longer for it to get to our tile lines. When it finally does get to the tile lines, the water coming out is generally a lot clearer. Okay, that means if it's clear, generally if we test it, it's going to be less nitrogen, less phosphorus. We're using Mother Nature to kind of act as a filter. <clears throat> roots do what? What do live roots do? They absorb soluble nutrients, soluble nitrogen, soluble phosphorus. We end up with a lot better water quality. The other thing it does is it decreases the flashiness. So when, when it rains, you will see our ditches go up and they'll go down very quickly and they'll be really brown and dirty. When we have cover crops in no-till, the water will soak in, we'll store it in the soil longer, the roots will absorb the nutrients, the water comes out clear, and then it's a slow release. We don't get that flashiness, okay? And the water's a lot clearer. So this is how we help with water quality. And it's also, we're promoting good soil structure and we're putting carbon into the soil. Okay, oats is one of our favorites. We really love oats. Uh, the benefits of the oats is, have you heard the term nurse crop? How many people have heard the, the term that oats are a nurse crop? The reason they're a nurse crop is they're highly mycorrhizal. So mycorrhizae are these beneficial fungus that get in the soil, and what they do is they infect a root and they actually bring back micronutrients and phosphorus to that plant, and in exchange, the plant will feed it some carbon, feed it some sugar, okay? And that, uh, these beneficial fungus are everywhere in the soil. They can reach out about six to 18 inches away from a root here, okay? And so they can really explore a lot of the soil, and they improve the efficiency of that plant for getting nutrients. And so oats are very good because it, it really, there's about 200 species of these mycorrhizal fungi, and it really generates, it will be a, a host to a lot of them. So we really like to see oats put out in front of another crop. It, it just helps get that mycorrhizal networks established so that when you put out your rest of your, your, your grain crop, they can take right off. They grow very deep, they have fibrous roots, they're great for compaction, 
great for scavenging nitrogen. You can broadcast them or they can be drilled. The disadvantage maybe of the oats is they, they will die probably by around Christmas time most years, uh, especially this Christmas. Anybody remember Christmas this last year? <laughs> Woo! Uh, the only bad thing about that, it maybe didn't last long enough. I know you didn't want to hear that, but the reason I like to see a really hard deep freeze is we're starting to see some problems with something called slugs and bowls. And what we really like to do with these cover crops is they're a great habitat for these things. But when we get a really hard, deep freeze for, it's probably got to be more than just three, four days, maybe a week or two, usually in January, what happens is the water table comes up, and if the frost line goes and meets that water table, you'll kill a lot of slugs that are in the, in the soil. So we like to see a hard freeze every couple of years that breaks that slug cycle. It'll do the same thing to the voles. Voles are just field mice. And field mice are mammals that eat a lot of seeds out there. But when we get too many of them, they start eating their crops and uh, cause a lot of damage. So I have whole talks just on slugs and voles, how we manage. Okay. Uh, what about, uh, this is what the oats kind of look like. And I guess my question to you is, is this a good field of oats or a bad field? And it kind of depends on your perspective. Now, uh, we planted oats three years in a row and we got three different results. And I'll explain why here in a minute. So the first year we planted oats a little bit later. They got up about this tall. And the next year we planted them to corn, okay? What, what happened to our corn yields? We got five to 10 bushel more, so that was good. The following year, the oats, we planted them a little earlier and they got up into the boot stage where the heads were just about ready to emerge. That year there was no change in the corn meal. And then the third year we had oats like this that were planted quite a bit earlier and what happened to our corn meal? Went down by five to 10 bushel. Why was that? It goes back to that carbon to nitrogen ratio. When it starts to become very fibrous and you get more lignin in it, uh, then what happens is it's going to suck nitrogen out of the soil. Corn loves nitrogen. It actually hurts your corn yield the following year. Now there's a pretty easy way, a couple easy ways to solve this. What's, what's one? Just add some diversity, add some clovers, legumes into the mixture. The other thing is if your oats get this tall, the cows love it, harvest it, feed it to your cows, get it back into the vegetative state, and uh, it's not a problem. Okay, so we just have to learn all the rules and figure out how to manage this thing. But you can get three different results off of oats depending on how you manage it. So you've got to be a little careful with that. All right, cereal rye. This is the one just about everybody plants simply because cereal rye came from Siberia and you can plant it any month of the year. It will germinate at 32 degrees, okay, soil temperature. So uh, you can plant it about any time of the year. Doesn't mean it'll grow. It may just sit there until the conditions are right, and then it may come up uh, in the in the spring. So if you really want to get the benefits from it, the, the goal is plant it early enough so we get some growth out there, so we reduce our soil erosion. Okay? You can graze them. Uh, it does have an aleopathic effect. Uh, it has a natural chemical. Uh, glucinate that's in the um, uh, in the stem and in the leaves and that will help to keep your weeds down so you don't have to use quite as much herbicide. One of the things we're trying to get away from is Roundup glyphosate. The problem we have with glyphosate is it's a major chelator and it'll grab onto our micronutrients and tie them up and unfortunately what impact is that having on our crop growth? Well, we can still get average yields, but when guys are trying to get the high yields, it tends to put a lid on. The other problem is, unfortunately, the food that we eat now has a lot less micronutrients in it. Is that important, say, during COVID? Can anybody tell me what the benefit of zinc is for COVID? You know, the doctors were saying you should take zinc. Why is that? Well, zinc actually reduces the virus load, doesn't allow them to reproduce, it does the same thing for a cold. So anytime you start getting a little bit of a sniffle, just take some Zycam and that zinc will help to fight off a cold, okay? How many heard that uh, during COVID you couldn't taste, you couldn't smell? As soon as somebody says they can't taste and smell, 
I instantly know that they have a zinc deficiency because you got to have zinc in order to be able to taste and smell. So if you're still having problems, up your zinc levels, try to get a little bit more of that in your body, you'll find out maybe you'll get your taste and smell back a little bit. But our food isn't as nutrient dense as it used to be, okay? We also like to use cereal rye with vegetable production. And what we'll do is we'll use a crimper roller, we'll roll it down and we can plant pumpkins into it or tomatoes or things like that. So it, it really makes a nice little barrier for the weeds and it's probably one of our most versatile. We can also use it uh, for forage. Sometimes some, uh, some of our dairy farmers are now uh, putting out cereal rye, and then they'll go to corn silage. And they can actually harvest four to six wet tons of forage in the fall, or in the spring, if they planted it in the fall, and then they can plant their corn. And then they've also got a place where we can get our manure applied uh, so that, that it helps. So, uh, cereal rye is one of those crops that would, is very versatile and we, we have a lot of good uses for it, okay? But there's a couple other ones, annual ryegrass. Now the problem with annual ryegrass is I did a lot of research on this earlier, maybe 15 years ago, and we were really promoting annual ryegrass at that time, not realizing that when it comes to annual ryegrass, it's a little bit like a thistle. It's a little hard to kill. The thing about annual ryegrass is it doesn't go dormant, and it just continues to grow all winter long. The top looks dead, but the roots are growing like crazy. When it comes to spring, you've got a very short period of time when it's about that tall you can kill it, or you gotta wait until it gets about this tall and it starts to head out. Otherwise, it's not taken in the herbicide. You can't crimp or roll it because it's too flexible, so it won't crimp or roll. So we're finding out that it has some advantages. It has 50% more roots but it's probably one of the hardest ones that we have to manage. So generally, I have some guys that will, will use annual ryegrass, but you better be on top of your game. You've got about 10 different things you better do. I'm not gonna go into all the details on that, but if you decide to use annual ryegrass, you have to be Johnny on the spot. You have to be a top. Man. I have found out that when I'm starting with guys, annual ryegrass is not the one to start with because uh, it can very easily turn into wheat for you. So it has a lot of advantages, but it also has a few disadvantages because it's a little harder to manage. So just telling you that a little bit, okay? Winter barley's one. Uh, we're starting to see guys are using winter barley. You can actually substitute this for corn one to one. Uh, it just puts a shine on the cattle. Uh, they, they, they love it. Uh, it's a little, not quite as winter hardy as the cereal rye. Uh, but it's better than the wheat, okay? And it's, it does tolerate a little bit lower fertility, all right? So that's one. These are some that are pretty, uh, the, the, uh, the one on the uh, uh, left up here, the, the top left corner is the pearl millet. It has a great big head. Uh, a lot of times guys uh, might take some of this and cut them off in the, in the fall and take them to the farm markets because they're so pretty you can put them in flower arrangements, okay? So that's one. The sorghum sedan, this is actually one of my favorite ones. If you have a field that's really compacted and is a poor producer, put out sorghum sedan. Plant your sorghum sedan, it's about like corn. It needs 100 pounds of nitrogen. Let it get about this tall, plant it after uh, uh, Memorial Day. Let it get this tall and either mow it or take it off and feed it to your cattle. Okay, you can add a little manure to it, make sure you harvest it a little bit high. Every time you cut that, what happens to the roots? You get five to ten times more roots. You can increase your organic matter in a really poor soil by about a half a percent in one year just by growing the sorghum sedan grass. Okay, so that's why we like the sorghum sedan. It helps break up our soil compaction. Dairy farmers used to tell me that when we were raising sorghum, he says when we would go to plow it and we would turn that soil over, that soil would just crumble, okay? Now, I'm not telling you to plow it. You don't need to plow it, but you're gonna get really good soil structure and it will break up your compaction. I've had guys that were raising soybeans and they were getting 30 bushel soybeans. They, they put out wheat and then planted the sorghum. The very next year on their soybeans, how much did their yield go up? Went from 30 bushel soybeans up to 49, almost 
a 20 bushel yield increase, all right? So you can get some really good yield increases. They were raising 80 bushel corn, and now they're raising 150 bushel corn by putting out sorghum after wheat, okay? And they found out that they were able to add that organic matter, get it back into their soil. This was on a paulding clay soil up in Paulding County. Anybody ever see that paulding clay soil? Boy, it, it's, it's uh, kind of a grayish color. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's a really high in clay content. It just looks like clay when you take it out there. It just all comes out in one big chunk. I was one time at a meeting and I plopped down two different soils there. One was black and just gorgeous. The other one was this gray, it looked like a, a chunk of concrete. And there was a guy sitting in the front, he says, you didn't get that soil from this county. He was talking to the black one. I said, yes, I did. I said, I got this one right here, came off of the end row. I said, this is paulding clay. He said, well, what kind, of, what kind of soil is that one? I said, paulding clay. Got it 30 feet from this one. It was in the fence row. Paulding clay is a beautiful soil if you don't beat it to death. Okay, what, what did we do over the last 100 years, 150 years, we took all the organic matter out of that soil, and that's how we ruined it. Okay, so if we put that organic matter back, it can actually be quite productive. All right, let's talk a little bit about the legumes. Legumes and clover, we already talked about that. Biggest thing you gotta worry about the legumes is when you go soybeans back to soybeans, they do tend to acidify your soil. So it's always good to put with these legumes, put a little bit of grass in there, and that kind of uh, balances it out, all right? So here's one that I really love is this Valencia. This is a real big uh, leaf on there. Notice it's got a pretty high biomass. We can get as much as 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre out of that. Really high crude protein. Some of the guys will feed this as forage to their cows in the Northeast. It tolerates our wet soils, and it also tolerates uh, low temperatures, okay? Very low seeding rate. You only need about five pounds to the acre. Uh, so it's very, very cheap, okay? Uh, another one is this crimson clover, one of the most beautiful ones. A lot of people like to see the crimson clover. About the first week, second week in May, you'll just see this red across this field. And once you see that red and, and the blossoms coming out, that's about the time that you want to terminate it uh, because that's when it has its maximum nitrogen. You can plant green right into it. The guys will take a no-till drill, plant their corn into it, and then you can actually use a crimper roller or you can terminate that with, with uh, herbicides, okay? But again, the earthworms love it. We don't get quite as much nitrogen out of the crimson clover. Maybe uh, can produce up to 140 pounds, but generally somewhere between 90 to 140. It's a little harder to kill and it's not quite as winter hardy. So now we're starting to use a little bit more of the Valencia out there. There's another pretty one. This one uh, really looks beautiful, these purple flowers, the hairy vetch. The reason most farmers don't like hairy vetch is it has hard seed. So if you plant that into like wheat, uh, the, the, and uh, it comes up, say, in when wheat's growing, uh, when they go to combine their wheat, they just got this long vine out there that just wraps, and it causes a lot of problems. It's pretty easy to take that out. You can actually just use a little 2,4-D and that'll take it out in the spring. But this is a good one where the soils are well drained on a slight hill. Uh, Dave Brandt uses a lot of hairy vetch. It can give you uh, 150 to 200 pounds of nitrogen. So what that does is that reduces your fertilizer cost by not having to use quite as much. So uh, it can be broadcast, the seed's quite small. I've actually got a field of cereal rye that I'm gonna be putting some hairy vetch out this spring. Um, maybe this next week, if the ground freezes up, I'm going to broadcast it. The reason I'm doing that is um, I want to try to have both the cereal rye and the hairy vetch. I get two different sets of uh, uh, mycorrhizal fungi, and then I'm going to be putting my soybeans, planting them right into that, and uh, then terminating them. And uh, hopefully that's going to switch on. We've had a guy that uh, was talking about this at the no-till conference in uh, Kansas, and uh, he was using hairy vetch and cereal rye, and generally they would get 100 to 200 pods per plant on soybeans. They had some as high as 1,000 where they had really good, strong hairy vetch, 
and a strong zero five. So we're going to see what we can do with that, see if we can maybe get a little bit higher. These are the Austrian winter peas, and notice right there the nodules on that. On all these legumes and covers, you've got to use an inoculant. Make sure you use the right inoculant, okay? And so that we have the Austrian winter peas, which we'll plant maybe around the 1st of August. The Canadian field peas, these are the true winter peas. You're probably going to plant these after soybeans. The difference between the two, Austrian winter peas can put on 150 pounds of nitrogen, but you've got to plant them early, and they're going to probably die out in the fall. And then that residue will be staying on top of the surface, and you'll plant your corn into it. With the Canadian field pea, the difference being is you're going to plant it in the fall. They'll get maybe about this tall. You have to let them uh, live throughout the winter, and then they'll grow in the spring. Uh, the problem is they don't have a whole lot of time to grow, so you only get about 75 pounds of nitrogen out of them. But, but uh, two different types of peas that would grow. One's the Austrian winter pea, the other one's the Canadian field pea. Okay? Disadvantages, uh, you do need to incorporate it when you get into these bigger sizes. You really need to drill them. Ideally, you should probably be doing that either sometime between August and September. Okay, So you can get some nitrogen out of them uh, as much as 200 pounds, but generally probably closer to 60 to 150 uh, pounds of nitrogen per acre. just depends on how thick they are. Okay, Medium red clover, a lot of farmers put this one out. Uh, this is a, a very good one. The problem with uh, red clover is it tends to attract the bowls. It's also the nitrogen is not quite as available to your corn the next year. Uh, and it's a little harder to kill. So you can't crimp or roll uh, the, uh, the red clover or the alfalfa. So uh, you do have to almost uh, terminate that. Or if you're organic, most guys would probably plow that under and use that as a green manure. But we're trying to get away from, from doing all that plowing because of the soil erosion. We have a farmer now, Rick Clark. He now farms 7,000 acres. He's using no-till, cover crops, and he's going 100% organic. I see the no-till with the cover crops and the organic people. We're not on parallel lines. We're starting to get to where those two are kind of merging together, and I think that's going to be a good thing. The biggest problem I have with organic fields is they use way too much tillage, and that hurts your beneficial microbes. It also causes soil erosion, okay? And some people will argue with you because they want to keep that, that big premium, but I think eventually we're going to come to where those two are going to merge together. We're finding more and more farmers are finding a way to marry those two together, okay? And that's what we're, we're looking at. This is a typical crop rotation. You might go wheat. And then where I got cowpeas, you could put a multi-species cover crop in there. Uh, go to corn the following year. After corn, you're probably going to plant rye because usually the corn comes off too late. Now you might be able to, if you planted, if you used your drum, you might be able to uh, uh, either interseed something in uh, June, or you could use a drone, say in September, and maybe put a multi-species mix in. Then go to soybeans. After soybeans, you got an option. You either go back to corn or you can go to wheat. Okay, so this is typically where we're finding ways to get the cover crops in here. Here's the cow peas. The same goes for winter peas. Just shows you that most of that nitrogen, research that was done at Ohio State, most of the nitrogen is actually moved from the roots when that plant starts to bloom into the stem and into the leaves and it's on the surface. Every time it rains, what happens? that corn gets a slow-release nitrogen as those leaves and stems start to, to uh, decay. Okay, so we're finding out that this really helps to work with our corn and our soybeans, okay? This is an example at Ohio State. This is corn in the background. Believe it or not, that corn has no nitrogen on. All the nitrogen came from the previous year. They had uh, uh, cow peas planted in here into the uh, uh, wheat plots. And those cow peas generated 150 pounds of nitrogen. And they didn't find any yield difference between where they used corn with no nitrogen compared to corn that had 150 pounds. Maybe one bushel. One bushel difference, which was considered insignificant. Okay? One of the things I've already talked to you about is you have to be very careful. Uh, most of our cover crop seed now comes pre-treated. 
and it'll be pre-inoculated. The problem is if you look at how long that inoculant lasts, sometimes it's only 12 to 48 hours. So it really helps if you're going to put out cover crops, get the right inoculant, put it on at the time of planting. Okay. The problem we have is sometimes we'll buy this pre-inoculated seed and it'll set in a warehouse. And once the temperature gets above 50 degrees, those mycorrhizae, the, or not the mycorrhizae, the rhizobia bacteria will start to die. They also die when they're exposed to sunlight. So you want to be real careful. If you have a cover crop that you're planting, inoculate it right before you plant it. Look for the, the nodules. When you pull up the nodules, if, you, if the plant, and you don't see a lot of nodules on there, the nodules will be kind of pink on the inside. If you don't see a lot of nodules on there, chances are 90% of the time, it's due to the fact you don't have enough inoculant out there. Okay, so if we're going to plant these more expensive cover crops like the uh, legumes and clovers, we need to inoculate. All right, so that's the key thing there. Oh, yeah. The other thing that I want to tell you is there are different strains, so you can't use a soybean inoculant. You've got to get specific inoculant. This is my couple of my last slides here, and we'll finish it up. Uh, when you're planting cover crops, we like to have this mixture. Ideally, in the soil, we like it to be about 24 to 1. If it's less than 24 to 1, that's going to be good for corn because it, it will release the nitrogen, okay? So corn kind of likes these lush things like the hay and the clovers. They like the things that are more like the rabbit that uh, very fast and decompose. If you're going to plant soybeans, uh, something like a rye that has a little bit higher lignin content, that's going to be a little bit better. Okay. Now I think we'll we'll, we'll maybe finish up here. Uh, any questions while we go through here? I think I only have. Here's just a sample of a three-way mixture, kind of radish, oats, and crimson clover. If you have any questions, go ahead and ask them. The reason I like this, this one is two of them die, the radish and the oats. But we have one brassica, one grass, and then one uh, that's a legume. The only one you have to manage in the spring is the crimson clover. If I substitute out the oats and put in cereal rye, now I have a little bit of a problem because the ideal time to kill the cereal rye is going to conflict with the time that it takes to kill that, that uh, clover. Okay, so a lot of times it's better if you go with these simple mixtures. You have two of them that will die out, then you only have to manage one. It makes life a little bit easier and you don't have to worry about it as much. Any other questions? Any questions on this, on how you can maybe get cover crops into your system? And what maybe what some of the benefits are, issues that you've had with the cover crops. I'm going to leave a little time for the questions here. Anything. One thing that we're trying to do is there, there are four principles that we're trying to, to follow uh, in the soil health. Number one is minimize your disturbance. The reason we do that is uh, so that we don't have the soil erosion. Second thing is we want to try to maximize surface color whether that be live roots or live leaves, or whether that be uh, residue on the surface, because when that rain comes down, sometimes it'll come down at 30 mile per hour. And when, it, when a droplet of water hits the soil, what happens to it? It can go up a foot and it can move out three feet. That dislodges the soil, and if you're on any kind of slope, it moves all the soil down, okay? And that's when we start to see the soil erosion. The third principle that we're trying to promote is have a live root out there as much as possible. Why is that so important? Again, live roots do what? Absorb the soluble nitrogen, soluble phosphorus. They improve our nutrient recycling, and they also improve the water quality. But also with that, we're building up the organic matter that's helping us with climate change and keeping that carbon dioxide in there. The fourth principle, the last thing that we want to talk about, is add that biodiversity. And that can be done a couple different ways. You can do that with crop rotation, but also adding in different cover crops, different types of roots, summer annuals, winter annuals, the grasses, the legumes, the brassicas, and uh, different types. Some of them that grow high, some of them that spread out. Just having different root architects, okay? That really helps keep that system really, really healthy. So if you, you apply those four principles, a lot of the problems that we have kind of in this world will go away. And this will be the last thing I tell you. 
I don't know if I told you this or not. I, I've talked to this a couple of people. I don't think I told you this. If I did, just tell me. I sometimes uh, forget who I talked to. Have you guys uh, noticed? I don't think I told you this, that the, the rain, how it's changed a little bit. Did I talk about the bacteria in the atmosphere? Okay, so they just recently discovered, this is in like the last six months, they found out the drought of 1930 actually lasted four years longer than it, than it needed to. Why was that? Well, if you remember back then, we were tilling up the prairie, and when you till up the prairie, uh, there's all these live plants out there. Well, when we have evapotranspiration, they've now discovered that there's 67 different species of Pseudomonas bacteria that are in the atmosphere. What do they do? Well, they form ice crystals up there, and they allow it to rain, okay? So if they would have had the live plants there with evapotranspiration, they would have got more of the moisture out of the atmosphere and it would have come down. Think about when you go to the tropics. Every day about 3.30, 4 o'clock, it starts to rain. They get a quarter inch, maybe a half inch rain for 10 or 15 minutes. It comes down you know, pretty, pretty hard. But what happens is in the morning, sun comes up, we get evapotranspiration, <coughs> the, the bacteria on those leaves go up into the atmosphere and about almost the same time every day, they start to form the ice crystals, and then it come down as rain. It can come down as rain, snow, sleet, hail, okay? Now, imagine what would happen if you didn't have the bacteria up there. All of a sudden, you get a bunch of moisture in the atmosphere, and when it comes down, does it come down in a half-inch rain, a one-inch rain? No, it comes down as a three, four, five, seven, eleven-inch rain, and that's what can have an effect on our weather. Okay? So we've disrupted these natural cycles of the water cycle. If we were to have cover crops across all the landscape, we probably would see a decrease in some of these really heavy rainfall events, okay? and they would even out a little bit. One of the things, I just came back from Kansas, and all the farmers were talking about this. What was Kansas like this year? Extremely hot and dry. But a couple farmers were noticing that the east half of Kansas got more rain than the west half. And part of the reason was they noticed that it was raining right where the rivers were, where they had all the trees. So the trees were probably putting bacteria up into the atmosphere. And now, yeah, they were still hot and dry, but they were getting some rains where just a few miles away from them, they were getting nothing. Okay, so these, all these things have kind of microclimate effects that we don't totally understand that we can help maybe solve some of the problems and the issues that we have, okay? Any questions out there? I know I've given you a lot of information in a very short period of time. How are we doing for time? Are you yeah. running out? Yeah. I figured minute. that. <laughs> I usually, I don't have a clock to time myself, but I figured we're getting real close. Yeah. So. Can we get a copy of your uh, Yes, I can make, well, I think, do you have that? She has that available. Yeah, so yes, uh, and I do give, I have uh, probably close to 30 different presentations that I give, uh, and a lot of it you can get off of my website. Uh, if you want to go to my website, Mormon Soil Health, I have a lot of information on there that's free to download, and a lot of fact sheets and uh, things like that. If anybody wants one of my cards, I do, uh, I do some uh, soil consulting, I do uh, soil testing, uh, I do teaching, I'm doing some research, and of course I do sell the uh, crimper rollers. I've been doing, uh, doing that. So if you need any help on any of those things, I can, I'm more than happy to, to help. The question over here. Would that include sources for like orchards? Orchards. I've started to do a little bit with orchards, but not a lot. But uh, I have a couple guys, they want me to come to Pennsylvania just to talk about the canopy around most orchards everybody's killing everything leaving it bare we're finding out that if we plant something like buckwheat uh, buckwheat is a, a great crop it's a great pollinator it can help to get better fruit set on your on your um, uh, trees uh, it also makes a little bit of the phosphorus available but we can plant some some different low growing covers in there that are bee friendly and are very nice i will tell you this buckwheat is a, a very good crop. There is a, a market for buckwheat honey. It's, it's a little bitter, 
But one thing you want to be careful about if you plant a solid field of buckwheat, do you want to be out there at 4 p.m.? Probably not, because at 4 p.m., about 9 o'clock in the morning, the flowers open up. At 4 p.m., the flowers shut, and it's full of bees, and the bees get a little ticked off at around 4 p.m. There's a good chance you'll get buzzed, okay? So you want to be a little careful, but you talked about diversity. Sunflowers and buckwheat are really good for adding diversity into your soil. Okay. Other questions quick. What's what your website? Uh, we'll go to the end here. You can, uh, oh, you can yeah. download it or you can get one of my cards here. We're just about got to the end here. Right there. Hormonsoilhealth.com. I don't remember it off the top of my head. And you can also get, uh, you can email me at hormonsoilhealthservices at gmail.com. So, all right. Well, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Uh, uh, coming up here, I uh, had a nice little drive coming down here. The weather was, it's just been great here. We haven't had much of a winter, I don't think, this year. But, uh, so we'll take about, a, at this point, it's uh, about eight to ten minute break, and then we'll gather back here for the second half. So we'll try to stay right on time here and get you all out to this nice day. So, what is the second half? It's um, a presentation on climate smart agriculture. There's a grant um, opportunity for um, getting involved in some specific programs that will, you know, again, improve conservation of farms. Jim for the first time about 15 or more years ago now 
And uh, my background is in sociology, um, measuring economic development and how local communities can um, basically improve quality of life through working with the environment and environmental quality. And I've had the opportunity to work in many parts around the world, um, including in agriculture and water, um, water treatment systems and water management. And after so many uh, years and experiences of working with communities and um, my, on my mother's side of the family, we come from an agricultural background and seeing the work that's gone on for the last 100 years or so and, and that farm operation and some other lands that, that we manage through programs like EQIP, um, it really came home to me that this new movement, which we'll talk about, from the US Department of Agriculture to put money into this term that, that they use called climate smart agriculture. There's a lot of words for that now, and Jim brought up a number of the terms um, which we'll get into. Um, this is a great opportunity to apply the science training background that, that I've been able to, to have through Ohio State into a, a new opportunity that we really just can't do through our university position. So we'll talk about some of that too, and happy to answer any questions about what we do both <coughs> with our Ohio State hats on or with the um, organizational hat on. So that's a little bit of my background. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Leo Dice. As you can tell, I have this accent. I'm originally from Brazil. I've been in Ohio since 2018. I came as a postdoc and I've been working in the university since then. I also went to North Carolina. I stayed there for a year before here. But I grew up in Brazil and I, I did agronomy and I started my uh, master and PhD in soil science and agronomy. And uh, I've been working with soil now in Ohio since 2018 uh, and under various uh, farming systems uh, and be, have been like emerging very deeply into the soils of Ohio. Now I consider myself knowing a little bit more about Ohio soils than my own state in South Brazil. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to be here. So I thank Michelle and Tocumseh for, for the opportunity today. I'm going to stay here on the side, let Joe lead the presentation, and I'll be talking in some parts of the presentation with Joe. So thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Um, so I just put some images up here just to kind of talk about the, the variability um, of different ways in which people grow food um, to use land they might have access to, either as owners or land stewards or um, as a uh, leasing arrangement, et cetera to produce food and to produce things that we need um, for our lives and our society. And that the project that we're going to be talking about is designed to work in lots of different geographical settings here in Southwest Ohio. So we'll talk about how this project can support projects, producers in very um, dense urban areas like in the city of Dayton or the city of Springfield into more rural areas and, and uh, more open spaces, which might be more the type of geography that maybe some of the folks in here are used to managing that type of ground. Um, a quick background on what is the one to five benefit corporation. Um, you maybe never heard the term benefit corporation before. I'm curious actually, who's heard of that term, benefit corporation, as a business type? No? Um, who's heard of a B Corp, like a third party B Corp? Two hands, okay. So this is a, a fun distinction. So the B Corp, which you're familiar with, is a voluntary certification that if your business is performing, um, providing value back to society, and it has to be defined in some way through environmental and social um, good, then you can be certified as a B Corp. Um, lawyers and other folks out there who uh, have different ways of looking at the world um, they came up with a new type of an entity called a benefit corporation, which is new to Ohio about two years ago. And it might be of interest to some folks in the room. I, I think the first state, it might have been in Vermont or Oregon or California, um, and certainly in the state of Delaware, where a lot of corporations are based out of. Um, it's an entity that's designed to become a B Corp, to get certified as a B Corp. But it's an actual legal vehicle now. So in Ohio, it's been two years now, this, this, um, the General Assembly passed it in 2021, that you can be a business that's registered as a benefit corporation, which you have to do through that is to specify what type of social good do you produce as a company while also remaining profitable. 
So we're one of those. We might be one of the earliest in the state of Ohio. And here's what we're trying to achieve through the organization. And we work on projects that help us achieve this mission and some specific points that we'll get into about soil organic carbon um, here in a minute. So that's a little bit of background about who we are. We, we don't even have a website, but we do have contact information and we're, we're here. We, we live not far away uh, in central Ohio, so we're, we're going to be spending a lot of time in, in southwest Ohio for the next five years and hopefully from going forward. My dad's originally from Dayton and we come through here. Um, so here's essentially one of the first things that we started to get into two years ago, taking the science and other work that we've generated through Ohio State or North Carolina State or other institutions we've been with different parts of the world, and trying to bring this to the state of Ohio. And I think everybody in the room is in some way tied to agriculture in one way or another, whether that's owning ag land or a producer, land manager, or somewhere in the supply chain and in business. So what we're working to do is to take the science, some of the things Jim was talking about from a soil science standpoint, specifically the measurement of soil carbon and soil properties, and help to determine a price that is reflective of the conditions that a producer is operating in. Uh, Jim mentioned paulding uh, clay, heavy clay soils that that type of soil is unique in the state of Ohio and it's different than say some ground that my family operates in Hocking County. It's almost apples to oranges. They are very different conditions. They were had different geological histories, etc. So we can't exactly compare them equally in Leo and my in our mind. So what we try to do is go to farms and take direct on-farm samples, which we'll talk more about in a way to create a measure of soil carbon that's more locally um, accurate in our mind and, and in the science's view. Then we take that information and we basically work with the producer to measure, approve on what our measurement of that soil carbon is, and then we sell it to a buyer. And you're probably familiar with these emerging um, climate uh, carbon credits. I, I, I won't ask for a show of hands, but I imagine there's some folks in the room who maybe have been approached by companies. Uh, Indigo Ag and um, Bayer has their own program. There's a number of entities out there that are looking to buy um, or lease your carbon that you're <coughs> sequestering in, in your ground and then sell that as a carbon credit. And the carbon credits are then used by large companies, especially operating in the state of California, um, other US states, and in Western Europe, who are looking to offset their emissions. So we're not exactly talking about that piece today, because that's not exactly where Leo and I are working. We're not selling carbon credits. That's not what this project is about. Because we're working with the US Department of Agriculture in this five-year project, where we know that the US Department of Agriculture is interested in learning more about soil health, about what types of practices on the ground lead to more permanent storage of um, soil organic carbon. And they are essentially, for the project we're about to describe, the buyers, the customers of the carbon itself. So we'll get into the specifics of the funding here um, that's associated with the federal government over the next five years. But it, this project does not prohibit participation in the carbon markets themselves, the private markets that are out there. Um, it's a public uh, set of monies that we're talking about here. So if you have heard about carbon credits, if you've gotten the letter in the mail or had the knock on the door, that is a separate um, world in and of itself. We're talking about USDA money that goes to pay towards soil organic carbon and some of the equip type projects that Tecumseh has already been uh, helping to steward. So actually, before we get into the method by how we do soil testing, any questions so far on what, <laughs> what this stuff means? It's a lot of jargon. So, yeah. so if we're already signed up for the Indigo thing, your program is still in play? Mm -hmm. Okay. Most likely. Well, we can talk into some specifics, but it's likely 
then it is still in play. But fine. Um, I mentioned earlier, and, and this is, uh, we'll get into some slides here that Leo is going to describe, which is about why we really focus on on-farm measurement. Um, with Indigo, you're probably familiar with how their sampling strategy works, and there are some methods that are used for those um, verifiers, which we're also trained in, and we've, we know how to do those things, but it's very reliant on um, sort of mathematics and projections based in other bodies of research that project or speculate, as we all have to do in some ways, on how much carbon is in the field. We are going to talk about a method that is much more on farm and much more grounded in comparing to the, the local conditions that are surrounding where that sample is taken. Do you want to yeah. this one? Well, as Joe was saying, we are considering each field with its boundaries, and we are going to sample soils in those fields to determine how much carbon is in the soil. And when we talk about carbon, we are also talking about soil organic matter. Some might, might be more familiar with soil organic matter. And why carbon is related to soil organic matter is that most of the soil organic matter is actually carbon. Around 58% of the soil organic matter is it's essentially carbon. So they are very associated uh, in between each other. But our idea is to go to each field determine the boundaries, sample the soil to determine how much carbon is in those soils. And as Joe was saying, some of the, the methods that are out there, for example, other companies are using that are more reliant on, on modeling. Uh, there are good things about that, but there are also things that we, we feel like it's not being very fair with some farmers, and especially those farmers uh, like Jim Horman was talking about, that have been doing cover crops, pasture management, and other sustainable practices through a long time. When you go talk to, to those other companies, they say like, you already, you, already, you already are doing this practice, so you're not eligible to sign up for this program. And we understand that that's valid, that's good, because some people have very degraded soils and, and they need to change their practices. But some farmers, they've been conducting very good practices for the soil for a long time. And we feel like there is a balance between what needs to be changed and what can be maintained. And our approach tries to value essentially both sides of the equation to work with farmers that need to improve their soils and also to work with farmers who have been doing very, a very great job in terms of carbon. And, uh, and then you'll see this uh, storage tanks that we used. And, and that's our analogy. We know that Ohio has many different types of soils and depending on the region that you are, for example, you go to Northwest, you generally have more clay in those soils. You go to around Worcester, around here, you have more silt loam soils. And the conditions are different. And we are translating the these differences into sizes of tanks. So we know that some soils, they have greater capacity to store carbon, and some soils, they don't have as much capacity. And to be fair, we are aiming to compare farmers that are with similar types of soil. So farmers in the Northwest, where they have more clay, they will be compared among them. Farmers around the Miami Valley, they will be compared among them, and most importantly, the soil is going to determine the pool. What type of soil do you have in your farm? And as we know that we can determine the size of the tank or what kind of soil you are in, we can also determine how full the tank is. So we, we know the projection of how much carbon your soil can store. And we also can measure how full that tank is, essentially. And translating that back into a farming system. A farmer who has been doing regenerative practices, uh, there are a wide diversity of them. Uh, they generally tend to have a tank that's more full. And a very degraded soil, for example, eroded soil that Jim was talking earlier on, or a soil that has 
being tilled a lot, that there's no cover crops. They generally have that lighter color, more yellowish, light brown, and they have a, the tank is less full, essentially. And knowing the size of the tank and being able to measure how full the tank is, we can determine the performance of each field in terms of how much carbon is in that field. Is the carbon content in that field high or is that, or is that carbon content in the field low? And, and that's our idea. We want to be fair with farmers and, and compensate farmers proportionally to how much carbon they have in their, in their soils, essentially. If you want to move ahead. And, and as I was saying, we know that different regions of Ohio, and even within a region, depending on where you are in the landscape, you, have, you could be in a soil X or in a soil Y. And here we are illustrating two different conditions in a soil that had, has low storage capacity and low and high storage capacity, but they also can be more or less filled with organic carbon, as you can see in, the, in those slides. And even being in different regions or in sort of the different conditions, we want to be fair with farmers that are in those different distinct conditions and measuring by measuring how full the tank is, essentially. And, and here's a little bit of the data that's backing this analogy, essentially. You can see we are using, as a proxy for soil storage, uh, here on the x axis, the clay concentration of the soil. So we can measure the clay. I know that most farmers know that the soil is, has more or less clay, but we're going to measure that in the lab to determine this, the size of that tank. So more clay, more fine silt, they generally determine a, a larger set, size of the tank. And on the y axis, we have how much carbon is in that soil, or the soil organic carbon stocks. And based on, you can see that they both increase here. As we increase the clay concentration, the soil organic carbon stocks, they tend to increase. But there is this behavior of a low performing accumulation and a high performing accumulation of carbon. And we are translating this into percentages of performance. So 100% full, 90% full, 50% full, uh, all the way down to 10% full. And just giving an example, if we go to a field and we see that the field has 25% clay, we are going to be measuring the performance in this section here and comparing fields that are similar in nature, essentially. And just to show what the impact of land use into this diagram here, we have these blue uh, circles, they are native forest soils. We have the green circles that are non-tilled soils. And we have the red circles that are intensively plowed soils. And you can see the distribution of native soil, native forest soils or forested soils. They generally have more carbon. No-tilled soils, they have an intermediate to high levels of carbon. And plowed fields, they generally have less carbon in their soils. But as Jim was talking earlier today, it's not as simple as I have no till or, or it's a combination of factors. And it's how well do you do your no till? Do you use cover crops? Do you do cover crop rotation? Do you use other strategies that match with the no till benefits and, and help to increase the organic matter? So each farm is in a specific case, they have different crops, they have different systems, and, and the technology, the, the theory needs to be adapted to those specific cases, essentially. And we are using uh, soil data that's from Ohio. This data has been collected in Ohio fields for several years, and, and we are using a comparison among, essentially, farmers that have been cultivating different types of crops all over Ohio for the past uh, few years. So <clears throat> let's um, transition now from that sort of scientific discussion about how we use existing data that's been collected through various on-farm trials that compare the percent clay and other soil properties to 
the carbon storage into this project here. So um, during the last uh, last year, around this time, we were working with uh, Tecumseh Land Trust and the other partners um, that are featured on the screen to submit a funding request to the U.S. Department of Agriculture's um, NRCS Regional Conservation Partnership Program. A lot of acronyms, as there always are here. Um, so if we say the R acronym RCPP, for this project, this is what we're referring to. But I imagine there are some in the room who when they hear RCPP, perhaps you're thinking of the Jacoby Creek EQIP related project that Tecumseh Land Trust, uh, Lauren and Michelle and maybe some others have been working with you on to, to implement over the previous five years. So my understanding is that is still in its kind of final cycle now and at times actually really quite well in a way because now we have a new cycle beginning but a very different project. So without getting too much into the semantics of the farm bill and the language, the previous RCPP, the uh, Jacoby Creek related um, water quality and the program that some of you might be familiar with, that was from a previous farm bill that had different types of strings attached. And there's always strings attached. So now we have some new strings in, in some good ways and in some challenging ways for this next iteration. One of the things that is different, actually just curious show of hands, who knows about EQIP or has worked through an EQIP? Okay. So this is different from an EQIP. So we'll, we'll go through the semantics here in a minute, but EQIP is not required as part of this RCPP. We have the freedom and flexibility under this latest farm, last year's um, legislation, to pay uh, producers for the soil carbon performance using the science and the slides that Leo was just reviewing. And EQIP can be brought in as well. So if, if EQIP was something that was working for your operation or for um, a land manager that you're working with, then perhaps it's something to be considered. That's included in this next project, but it's not required. And in fact, it's kind of a lower priority item to both us as partnership team and to the, the USDA. And here's the project site. So to qualify for the funding opportunity here um, requires uh, several parameters that are um, qualifications that we'll get into in a minute, but this is the geography that is supported through this RCPP, this next five years. Is anyone familiar with these major land resource areas? Have you heard of this, um, this term before? Anybody? Okay. Um, in our world, we, we hear this a fair amount. So soil scientists from the U.S. Department of Agriculture over the last century have built up profiles of the soils of America. And they've created different classes, just like there's um, climate classes of, are you a seven, which means your temperatures are in this range. Similar to those classifications for the climate and weather are for soil type. And we are generally in this area, mainly in the, what the USDA describes as the central feed grain and livestock, also called like the Corn Belt region, um, given soil properties. So this is work that we work closely affiliated with at Ohio State, where we're looking at how do those soil components, and there's other factors too, it's not just soils, but that's the main, um, what differentiates, say, the MLRA of Southern Clinton County with the MLRA of Northern Champaign County. It's different soil types with other differences too. So one of the things that the USDA is interested in is to know how does soil carbon buildup operate differently across these four different soil types. And what's one of the wonderful things about Southwest Ohio is you do have a lot of diversity or we might use the term heterogeneity in terms of the different types of soils that are here. So it gives the USDA, if we can gather the data on the soil and report it back, insight into 
soil organic carbon performance in a very diverse area. And then you add what is also a layer here, the light, this grayish color. That's also a, a, a dynamic worth noting because these are urbanized areas. So some you might make some assumption here. These are incorporated areas of cities or villages. And there's a general association, as you might, as you know, um, like here in the city of Dayton, those have been highly disturbed soils through building of houses or roads, industrial sites, etc., that may not be exactly reflective of, um, if we're in Clark County and we're in the city of Springfield, if we go out to the east in Clark County, you might see the characteristics associated with the Indiana Ohio Till Plain classification 111A type. But in the city of Springfield, it might be so disturbed that it's no longer reflective of those soil conditions. Does that kind of make sense where we're going? So they want us to basically work in this project to gather soil samples that reflect some of this diversity. So we can know, so the USDA can know and others who are participating in this group, our partnership team, how does 114A in this region differ from this region? And how do urban soils perform in comparison to more rural, un less um, maybe infrastructurally disturbed soils and non-metro areas? It's a lot of words. I'm so sorry for your eyes. Don't even worry about reading it. If you, it's just this is a quote taken from the um, funding request we submitted to the USDA, and these are some of the the highlights here are what stood out to them. So this was kind of like the Jacoby Creek project, an extremely competitive program. There were, um, I think it was 11 projects like this funded across the United States, but hundreds and hundreds of applications. So. It is very unique that we have this opportunity here in Ohio and in Southwest Ohio in particular. And when we've talked with the coordinator from the state and from the federal level, it's the kind of language we have here that stood out to um, the reviewers at the federal level. There was a very strong interest in rural to urban linkages, and that's something that we've been hearing back. And it, it's actually one reason why we have a lot of freedom with how the financial assistance can be provided, because the USDA wants to see how urban producers can be supported through these carbon credits or carbon measurements alongside uh, rural producers. So something to keep in mind as we go forward. So to enroll into this RCPP, this forthcoming RCPP, there are the kind of standard USDA qualifications that you're likely already familiar with if you've participated in the past. Um, unlike perhaps, I imagine, elements of the Jacoby Creek, this is not an easement-oriented um, program. So the two types of farmers or landowners that can participate, they have to have ownership of the land and be either the primary manager of the land or the owner of the land. So, um, and these are on private lands. So I, I don't know, Michelle, the terms of the previous project in, in depth, but this is about land that you either own or you're operating directly. And the benefits, so, we're copy-pasting uh, USDA language here. The benefits, the financial assistance must go to the land owner or the land manager. That's who gets compensated through the project. And one, one other thing is we, like Michelle and Lauren have experienced, we are working almost on a weekly basis with the NRCS Ohio office to get approval on every every single thing we do. So every item of paperwork, every um, box that's checked, this is closely with the 
NRCS Ohio office. So that'll be very similar to what the last five years were with Jacoby Creek. Well, that, that will stay the same in how we report it back to the state. So bringing back, this is the same map from two slides ago. The contracting model to participate is on an annual year that can be renewed, but it's single um, calendar year contracting. And I'll get to the timeline, we'll get to the timeline later on, but we can actually start and uh, producers can enroll into the program as soon as this year, um, but the latter half of this year. We're structuring it so that the USDA will free up financial support to um, support up to 20 producers per year across this pretty wide um, geographic area. And the starting point is having an FSA farm identification number. Um, we can talk about some of these after if you have a specific <coughs> question. And this is an important point here, diverse range. Um, I'm going to talk about those on the next slide. But here's the general overview. <coughs> so this part, I'll probably even confuse myself as I talk about it, because it is a little confusing. Leo and I spend a lot of time in university, so we're used to talking in complicated ways. Um, but I'll try to make this as straightforward as possible. So the USDA wants us to work with a diverse range of producers. And that diversity is from several, several ways of defining what diversity is. One of those ways is operating ground in one of these four <coughs> soil types, essentially, that I talked about earlier that we were showing. Because they want to see soils coming in through this project that are based in each of these four areas. They also want to see that there are producers operating in metropolitan areas and non-metropolitan areas. So in Clark County, just by definition, that means that any ground in Clark County is associated with the Springfield metropolitan area, according to the census. But we know that Clark County has a lot of rural land that's not incorporated into Springfield. So they want to see that there are producers from the city of Springfield as well as from rural parts of Clark County to compare the um, soil types of urban and rural. Um, there's only two counties that are in this six uh, project area that are not even considered to be associated with the metropolitan area. And those are at the very top and bottom of the area, which is Champaign and Clinton. And Dayton obviously is a bigger city and it impacts a bigger, wider range. So you could be operating here in Green, uh, Green County and um, be technically part of the Dayton metropolitan area, even though it may seem like you're far away. That makes sense. There's also um, aspects through this project where the USDA wants to see different farms and farm structures supported. And that relates to both the structure and some additional qualification rankings based upon the profiles of the producers or landowners themselves. So let's start with the, the structure of the farm. So these are our, our minimums, and we have to check in with the state of Ohio kind of consistently as applications come in to make sure that there's representation of, of what we might call larger farm operations, bigger than 500 acres, and those that are smaller. And we can assume that some of these, uh, the urban ag, I don't know if anyone here identifies or is working as an urban agricultural producer, but those are usually less than five, well, certainly a lot less than 500 acres, usually less than 10 acres, or even less than five acres. So a one acre, a, a producer operating on a one acre lot in the city of Dayton, for example, is essentially given the same opportunity to be enrolled in the project as someone operating 800 acres. That sounds really confusing, but I'll answer, we'll answer questions about this at any time if you have. 
There's also, Jim talked a lot about livestock and cover crops, um, grazing opportunities. There's also an interest from the USDA in seeing how do livestock systems impact soil carbon buildup, permanence, and how that can be different in the different soil types. Um, this here, qualification rankings. This is what happens when, uh, if someone is enrolling, trying to uh, working through the application portal to apply to this project, which we'll, we'll talk about later on, it's going to open later this year. There will be certain ways in which an, someone who's enrolling will get additional points. It's a competitive selective process that again is being vetted by the USDA. And what they're going to be looking through in this, in the ranking system, are several of these components right here. Um, RCPP partner means being part of the creation of the project. Um, we will be asking questions about um, participation in, in soil health education. Um, this is a regional conservation partnership program. So there is a, maybe different from maybe some other projects, there's a strong interest in those that are interested in being part of a community-wide effort. So sharing uh, data, those types of things are not a requirement to be a part of the project, but we are wanting to work with producers who are open to the idea and have in the past come to maybe meetings like this, um, are open to training neighbors or other members of the, the wider six county area and exchanging knowledge. That's again, something different. It's not a wide state level thing or national level. This is a community oriented project. It's partly how um, building upon work that Tecumseh and others have, have put a lot of energy, probably many in this room too. Um, we know that there have been historical barriers for black, indigenous, people of color, various demographics that have been <coughs> not given equal opportunity to participate in certain farm bill programs over our history. And that's true in Ohio and in other parts of the, the country. So this particular NRCS, and there's a moment now, where funds are prioritized for black, indigenous, and people of color by pocket. We can talk about what that means and, and how those descriptions are, are measured, um, how the NRCS would describe um, these social demographic characteristics. Um, but that is also a factor. There's other types of, the NRCS uses the word historically underserved designations, so veteran status, um, beginning new farmers, who also have ranking uh, bonus points, qualification rankings as part of this. Um, and then more general openness to, there's a lot of technical assistance involved in this work. So a lot of um, planning for soil health, um, being open to data that comes back about soil carbon performance. And this is a five year project. So there is an interest um, from the USDA to see how um, changes can be built up over time. And that means conversation, sharing, um, Management practices, and if you've been part of EQIP, you've been part of these programs before, you know that it might involve a fair, fair amount of paperwork. And um, we want to know that a producer is interested in being part of this um, and helping to share data back. So let's talk about the funding itself. So this project earmarks about $2 million, a little over $2 million over five years that would go directly to producers for soil carbon performance. And if you're familiar with the um, EQIP program, NRC pra NRCS practice reimbursement. <laughs> Who recognizes one of these programs or has done something like this on ground they manage? Yeah, there's a lot there. So like an EQIP project, all of these are eligible for reimbursement. And this is the only one slide. We have a whole other one too. There's a lot to order off the menu. It's like walking into to McDonald's, the menu is, is, is a lot of options on the menu. Um, because there's a second slide here too. So if there's anything that you're planning to do in your operation and that you're trying to find ways to finance it or to get reimbursed for that work, this is similar to what the Jacoby Creek project was about, where if you would enroll producers who are, who are involved in the project can be reimbursed for, and I'll get into the dollar figures, we'll deal with dollar figures in a second, 
for these practices. There's an asterisk here for waste storage facility. This is a, a much smaller scale than basically the NRCS, and we agree that this can't exceed uh, a certain very high dollar amount. So it's a, it's a much smaller facility type, not the larger. Um, but we, if you have a question about the one that's asterisk here, we can talk about. So the other area, the non-equip, and this is that kind of freedom flexibility we have in this project, is for the soil carbon uh, performance. And we, we've built the funding structure here to basically maximize the amount of money that a producer can get through this, while also being eligible for um, enrolling as a, um, I'll get into this in a second, but if, if a producer enrolls in this side of the, this RCPP, you're not prohibited from also getting reimbursement here. It's just you can put more of your financial assistance into this side of the ledger. Do you want to start on this and then go to the next? Well, uh, just complementing what Joe was saying, uh, our idea is to provide flexibility in terms of how producers can be compensated. And you can think about two main uh, sides of the equation. One is if you, you could use the soil as an indicator of carbon and be paid for how much carbon you, you have in your soil. It, and that might be a better option for farmers that have been doing conservation practices for a long time and they know the region, they, they know that their soils have a higher level of carbon. We'll be measuring that and providing that information as well to the project. But in general, that's something that you can maximize, let's say, uh, reimbursement of financial assistance without the equip side of paperwork and going through the practice implementation. Or if you want to build up soil carbon using those codes that Joe was showing, for example, planting cover crops, all the way to building fences for a, for a grazing, uh, for a pasture, or other things. You can also use uh, the practices themselves and be paid for them. The difference is that NRCS has rates of payment already defined for this practice, essentially. And most of you have already done equip know that. We cannot change how much you will be paid, for example, for a cover crop practice. That's based on USDA rate of per acre, uh, and there are some variants within that. But that is something that we cannot change too much. And especially if you are in smaller properties, smaller farmers, sorry, smaller farms, you know that sometimes those codes don't add too much. So if you get paid a certain amount and you have a couple acres, we cannot change how much you'll be paid for a cover crop. It's, an, uh, it's a rate per acre defined by the, by the USDA. On the other side, if it's a, the, the financial assistance with the performance of how much carbon you have in your soil, is something more flexible. And we have a ceiling of how, the maximum amount we can pay based on performance, but it will be the same for a smaller producer or for a larger producer. And that means that smaller producers could take more advantage of that uh, as compared to some NRCS codes. Uh, if you wanna, again, just going through this, I'm gonna show, we're gonna show, um, can I just dip the laser here? Yeah. We were talking about higher performing soils and low performing soils, right? And other different conditions of capacities to store carbon. And here's a table that summarizes that. The values are a little bit different because we converted that from soil organic carbon to CO2 equivalent, which is the universal unit of carbon uh, when you commercialize that product, even though this is an NRCS project. We're going to compare different uh, types of 
soils under different classes of performance. So are you performing more than 90% under your soil conditions or between 75% and 90%? All the way down to 10 to 25% in a low performing soil in terms of when I say low performing is how much carbon is in that soil. The producer can be paid proportionally of how much carbon they have in their soils, essentially. But it's a performance base and not a amount of carbon base. Because when you're doing uh, signing up a contract with a private company that wants to sell the carbon credits, the more acres you have, the better. Because you have more carbon, essentially. Uh, and it's a simple mathematical question. One acre, you have that much of carbon. 100 acres, you have 100 more, uh, 100 times that amount. And, and that's good for larger farmers. But smaller farmers, it's hard to, to even compare how much carbon you, you can have. So we adopted this relative measure of performance from 0 to 100% because that can benefit all sizes of farmers. And smaller farmers will have a higher pay on a per acre basis, essentially. But these are uh, these values will be corrected for inflation over the five years, and this is an average of how much a producer could make per year over five years, depending on the performance. So up to, to around twenty thousand dollars per year per producer if you achieve the maximum capacity of storage, essentially. But as we were saying, we are very flexible on the approach. If the producer doesn't want to use the performance only because perhaps he's still building up the soil, carbon, and wants to perhaps rely on that performance later on, you can use, uh, instead of using 100% of this money coming from performance, you can also supplement that with NRCS practices, and that's going to deduct of how much you're, you could be paid for performance. So let's say that you use cover crops, and cover crops pay up to $2,000 per year because you have a limited number of acres. That's how much NRCS pays you per acre to plant cover crops. You could use the remaining 18,000 for performance, and it's going to be evaluated based on this uh, diagram that we have here. Any questions? I know, I know, Joe and I know that it's a lot of numbers, a lot of different types of, uh, let's say, approaches, but it's a it's a different way of uh, working with producers, and we are trying to learn from past experiences and seeing what's going on in the market, in the broad market, and trying to really be fair. And, and we always use this uh, saying that we know that each producer, when they do a certain practice, if they say, I'm going to do no-till, there are 100, 100 ways that you could do no-till. Every condition is different. And it's hard to rely on asking a producer, are you, going, are you doing this or that? We're going to be asking the soil instead of the producer. And the soil is going to answer us in terms of uh, carbon, a measure. It's like when we go to the doctor and, and get a blood sample. There's no way to run around the glycose levels or other things when we go to the doctor. And we can do the same with soils. We can do soil analysis, highly accurate measures of how much carbon you have there. And we know that carbon reflects the practice that you do in your soil. The soil is the memory of the system, essentially. If you've done cover crops, if you've done no-till for several years, that's going to be reflected in your soil. You'll have a darker soil, <laughs> crumbly, more structure. And we can measure that. And we aim to compensate farmers based on that. So these are a little bit of the, the money figures. Joe, do you want to talk a little bit about sure. that? So you mentioned indigo uh, participation. So there's, there are companies out there, Leo mentioned, they'll pay you by the volume of carbon that's estimated to be in the ground. And those require some sense of um, additionality, et cetera. Um, we're not participating in those systems. That's not 
we have no affiliation with those organizations, and, and frankly, it's not part of what we do. But the only key, um, what would I say, disqualifier of the funds here would be if you're already receiving USDA payments for the same, um, let me just go back a couple slides here. You can't be double pay, you can't, the term might be double dipping with federal dollars. Even actually, they define it beyond the USDA. I don't know what other programs you might be enrolled in, but no federal dollars can be double dipped here. So, um, but of course, that's on a year on year basis. So, I, I do want to acknowledge the question about um, Indigo. That likely would just be your own business or whoever's own business. That's not affecting us. What we are looking into, it's something that we've just been exploring, are ways to work with um, philanthropists or others who have a vested interest in this work too, that would want to provide supplemental additional monies because they know about the science that's happening, they have the data, they have the measurements, and that might send a signal to someone out there. We can it basically enhance the payments because what the USDA is paying, it's nice, what, what is here, we would love to use this as a way to amplify with additional funding. But we have not secured that yet, there is no guarantee, um, but that's something over the next five years we want to pursue. Um, because we know that there are entities out there doing that. Um, so I just want to make it a note here um, that that's something we're going to seek to do, but we just we can't do it. Uh, we can, I can't make a guarantee right now. The second bullet point, um, there are a number of research collaborators that we work with um, in other areas of our work at Ohio State and other places that are very interested to learn about how these climate smart, um, these monies that are going out from the USDA, will consumers pay more for them? Will that enhance um, maybe the value of, of acreage of the farm itself, knowing that it's got climate smart agriculture um, validated soil carbon buildup. There are these questions that economists and other people have. So there will, there will be very likely opportunities to participate in additional research on farm that could lead to supplemental money that isn't reflected on the previous slide. But again, that's still very new and this is a five year project which is getting started. Um, we yeah, please. Would you say how, exactly how do you measure carbon in the soil? Uh, that's a very good question. We use probes to go to the farm. We sample down to, to 12 inches. And we take those soils to the lab. We, we separate into uh, three different depths. We measure those depths. We take those soils to the lab, quantify how much carbon we have, and then we can determine how much carbon is in that field, essentially. So you take the soils to the lab, they put the soils in this um, machine that burns the soil with a super high temperature, and, and essentially when you burn the soil, you burn the carbon out, and by weight they take the difference and they know how much carbon is, is in that soil. It's essentially a highly precise measure. You can tell once you get that sample from the field, and there are specific ways that we're going to sample the field to represent the field well, it's not simply go there and take one probe. We need to collect several probes, mix the soil really well, take that soil to the lab, and, and the soil does the, the lab does the analysis and quantify how much carbon you have. And that turns into pounds per acre uh, in that specific back in the soil. Yeah. 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 I'll just add the USDA has the people that work in counties and at state level, federal level, like they have. But I think that at the federal level, they are seeing that the capacity of USDA to provide assistance to producers is limited and therefore they are developing these different kinds of contracts that allow private companies to work with the USDA to develop some of the activities. Um, so you're paid by the USDA, not by the farmers? Yeah, on, yeah on, on this contract, yes, on the RCP. Yeah. 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 Yeah
and it is a, a team-based effort. So uh, it comes as why why we're here today. There's other um, partners here on the screen. Um, some of you might be associated or know of Agraria. Um, the Ohio State University, that the soil, the, the equipment it takes to do that carbon measurement is very complex. Um, and that's they're going to be contributing the soil testing components to the project. Um, the retreat at Evans Farms, I don't know if anyone knows John Evans, his family up in Clark County. Um, they have a, an event space. Um, they're also, a, they, they have I think 700 acres of ground that they manage, but also they have a farmhouse and other venue for um, educational events. So we're going to be working with retreats um, maybe a couple times over the next five years to host a kind of an informational session, kind of like what Tecumseh has organized today with, you know, soil experts and cover cropping for technical support. Um, and does anyone know Oaks and Sprouts? Um, they're a small operation up in Champaign County, um, but they do work with, with goats and they're using terms like regenerative livestock management or um, soil health and they're raising uh, vegetables. They do a lot of um, interesting work with soil health um, and they're part of the team. So what are the steps, the concrete steps, for an individual that wants to participate in this? What are the next steps? So we're a little bit early. A month from now, we would be able to say with abs almost absolute certainty what the next steps are. We have three weeks before, because oh, the NRCS Ohio is doing their own kind of work while we're doing our own. And we'll get to the table on the 16th of March, sign all the details. What the tangible next steps are like, we hope, if everything goes to plan by mid, certainly by mid-summer, we'll have application windows opening up. And that will be an application system that will happen online. And you'll be an interested producer or landowner, just fills out a couple of questions. And then Leo and I working with the county FSA office, um, whether that's Greene County, Clark County, or the other four, will make sure to verify the accuracy of the farm numbers and all these things, just basic qualifications. And then the NRCS Ohio will work with us to do a ranking. So honestly, it's, it's very not detailed right now because we have to sign all the agreements before we know exactly how their application window will open. We're kind of like the brokers here. They actually run the system on the back end. So is our contact 125 Benefit Corps an email site or? Yep. Um, this is the email uh, Leo and I use to manage the project. And they could also get in touch with us as a partner, too. Yeah, I was just going to ask if an email would go out when the application period begins for um, members or are we to join your email list? Is that the best way to do it? Yeah, I think if you're already in, so building on Michelle's point, so Tecumseh Land Trust is a partner, and they're part of the approved team to be distributing information about it. So over the next few months, we'll be building out like those communications, and to answer your question, it'll have steps. So I think either A, yes, we will build an, an, an email list, or we'll just if you're already connected to TLT, we'll be going through those channels as well. <coughs> Any other questions? Otherwise, I can thank Joe and Leo for their presentation, and um, this is a really exciting opportunity.